Hello, and welcome to Really Big Hat. My name is Jared, and this is D&D Builds, the show where we build D&D characters. This time, I've got something really special for you. A build that I'm calling the Core Four. A multi-class of the four core pillar classes of D&D. The Fighter, the Cleric, the Rogue, and the Wizard. So first, a little background on how I came about this build. I was thinking of doing a video where I started at level 20 and built a character for top tier high level D&D play. Of course, that got me thinking of different multi-class combinations. I was going over what goes with what, how many levels to take of each, and inevitably, whenever I start multi-classing like that, I started thinking of everyone's favorite multi-class character, Absurd. Now, for those of you who may not know, Absurd is a character from Puffin Forest's D&D video where he built a character that multiclassed into every class of D&D, and the idea of it was so absurd that he named the character as such. But I got to thinking, well, instead of multiclassing into everything, what if I just took the four core pillar classes of D&D, the fighter, the cleric, the rogue, and the wizard, and tried to meld them together into one gigantic uber beast that was basically an encapsulation of the prototypical D&D party that would have one of each of those classes. And I must say, the results absolutely surprised me. This character is not absurd in the least. In fact, I would say that this is a viable build whether you're starting at level 20 or you're starting at level 1 and playing through a full campaign to level 20. This is an interesting and deceptively powerful build that has a lot going for it. So from here, I'm going to return to my normal format of walking you through a character from level 1 to level 20. But I want you to keep in the back of your mind that this character was designed backwards. This is from level 20 to level 1 rather than from level 1 to level 20. And once we get to level 20, I'm going to go over a lot of different things that I was thinking about for that high-level play. So, this will be an interesting build. Hold on to your seats. So, starting off with our race, we have several options, as per usual. We can always start off with a custom lineage or a variant human in order to get a starting feat at level 1, and this is a feat-hungry build. Or we could go with a half-elf or a mountain dwarf to get some extra ability score improvements over some of the other races. And this is an ability score improvement hungry build because this is a mad character, multi-ability score dependent, so you do have to have a lot of ability scores very high for this to work properly. And that is actually why the race that I wound up picking was the Player's Handbook Basic Human. The human's one and only racial feature, not counting getting a language, is that they get a plus one to every ability score. And that helped me out specifically when I rolled for stats for this build, because I rolled these stats. And yes, I freely admit this is freaking ridiculous. This is over the average by far, but I rolled them and I'm taking them. <laughs> And on that note, I would highly, highly recommend rolling for stats with this character because it does produce higher results than a point buy on average. And we don't really want to be using a point buy because we'd be having to run something like this, which, you know, I mean, if you have to do a point buy and you really want to run this character, that's just what you're going to have to do. Uh, you're going to have to dump strength, you're going to have to dump con, you're going to have to dump charisma, and pump up your dex, your int, and your wisdom as high as you can get them. But for me personally, I'm going to use the stats I rolled, and I'm actually never going to take an ability score improvement. The reason that wisdom is bumped up by two points instead of one here is because I've taken a half feat at a certain level within a certain class instead of an ASI, we will reveal that once it's time, but uh, just in case you were curious why Wisdom is getting pumped up by two, it's because this character's already at level 20 on my stat sheet, and I've already taken the half feat to bump it. 
So to start out the build, we are going to begin our career as a fighter. Specifically, we're going to be going after the Battlemaster subclass. Along the way, at first level fighter, we're going to pick up second wind, allowing us to recover some HP as a bonus action. And we're going to pick up a fighting style. And I would say definitely take archery. I would recommend for these first fighter levels to either be using a longbow or a hand crossbow and save that hand crossbow for later because that's going to be our primary ranged weapon in a bit. And just, yeah, stay at range, make ranged weapon attacks with your archery fighting style giving you a boost to hit, and just be a ranged fighter for these early levels. You can swap to a melee weapon if you have to, if you get into melee combat, you're a fighter, you're gonna be pretty good at that but yeah try and stay ranged at level two of fighter we pick up action surge one of the premier class features in the game right now all that's really going to let us do is make two weapon attacks instead of one on our turn but later on in the build this is going to lead to some crazy combinations we can pull off at level 3 of Fighter, we are able to take our subclass and choose the Battlemaster archetype, and that allows us to pick up three maneuvers. I would recommend getting Menacing Attack, Pushing Attack, and Trip Attack, but really read the Battlemaster maneuvers on your own and decide what's going to be best for you. Those three are just some evergreen good choices that can come up in a lot of different situations and help out. At level 4 of Fighter, we got our first ability score improvement, and I would recommend using this to take the Crossbow Expert feat. This will allow us to use our bonus action to do another crossbow attack with our hand crossbow. And then rounding things out at 5th level and our last level of Fighter, we get extra attack, allowing us to attack twice instead of once when we take the attack action on our turn. That means with Crossbow Expert, we can make two crossbow attacks with our main action, attack, and then a bonus action to make a third crossbow attack. So at this point of the build, we are now a fifth level fighter, and it is time to decide what to multi-class into next. What I'm going to suggest is going into Cleric next. Specifically, I'm going to pick Trickery Domain, mainly because I really like their domain spells, but also their channel divinity can be pretty darn useful from time to time. As our first level class features, the first one I want to mention is the best class feature you could ever get for any class in the game, Spellcasting. We also get Blessing of the Trickster here at first level. We can use our action to touch a willing creature other than ourself and give it advantage on stealth checks for an hour. And we can use that as many times as we want, keeping in mind that we can only have it up on one creature at a time. Anyway, what about our spells? We are going to be able to prepare a few first level spells and we're gonna learn some cantrips here at this level. For the cantrips, definitely pick up Guidance. It's a go-to for clerics for a good reason. It's a great cantrip. Uh, if you're a weak, piddly little human like me, maybe pick up the light cantrip so that you can illuminate your weapon and be able to see in the dark without disadvantage on you know all your attack rolls and perception checks. And then you can pick up something like Spare the Dying or maybe Thaumaturgy. Uh, there are a good number of utility cleric cantrips that you can choose from, so get the one that speaks to you. Then for our first level spells, we are going to be picking up Charm Person and Disguise Self for being a trickery cleric. And I would also suggest picking up Bless here. Keep that prepared most of the time. Healing Word you always want to have prepared. These are great spells. Oh, and if you're going to use Charm Person, little trick here. Use Disguise Self first, before you approach the target. Then charm them as a disguised person. Then, once the charm wears off and they're wondering who just charmed them, you've already walked off, dropped Disguise Self, and they will never find out who got them. At level 2 of Trickery Domain Cleric, the trickeration continues as we get our Channel Divinity Invoke Duplicity. We can now use our channel divinity to create an illusory duplicate of ourselves. It costs an action, but we create a perfect illusion of ourselves that lasts for one minute or until we lose our concentration like we were concentrating on a spell. It appears in an unoccupied space we can see within 30 feet of us. As a bonus action, we can move it up to 30 feet, but it must remain within 120 feet of us. 
And for the duration of it, we can cast spells as though we were in the illusion space, but we must use our own senses. So we can't send the illusion out around a blind corner and fire guiding bolts out of its position without us being able to see the target. But additionally, when both us and our illusion are within five feet of a creature that can see it, we have advantage on attack rolls against them given how distracting the illusion is. All in all, this is a very cool feature. It kind of turns us into a mini Echo Knight, and that's not a bad thing to be. Then at level three of Cleric, level eight overall, we hit a power surge, actually. We get access to second level spells, among them, Spiritual Weapon, but we can also pick up great spells like Aid, and the Trickery Domain gives us Mirror Image and Pass Without Trace. So these are a lot of really great options. Let's go in alphabetical order. Aid is a great buffing spell. It doesn't require concentration, and it just raises your hit point maximum. That means it stacks with temporary HP that you might be getting from other features, such as like somebody with the Inspiring Leader feat. Mirror Image is a great defensive spell. It puts up three duplicates of yourself that the enemy is going to have to try and swing through to actually hit you. Pass Without Trace is one of the best stealth spells in the game. You get a plus 10 to dexterity stealth checks, and you can only be tracked magically. And that brings us to the big, bad spiritual weapon. It is a bonus action to cast, so that does conflict with our crossbow expert, but I believe this is additive rather than competitive. As a bonus action, we can create a floating spectral weapon within range, last for the duration, or until we cast a spell again, the duration is one minute. We can make a melee spell attack against a creature within five feet of the weapon, and on a hit, the target takes force damage equal to 1d8 plus our spell casting modifier. As a bonus action on our turn, we can also move it up to 20 feet and repeat the attack as the same bonus action against a creature within five feet of it. We also get to choose the form of the weapon, which is a fun little bit of flavor. All in all, this is a great concentration-free method of increasing your damage, and it will do a little bit more damage than your crossbow expert attack, unless you're adding a maneuver to that. I don't believe rules as written you are able to add Battlemaster maneuvers to a spiritual weapon attack. I could be wrong, but I don't think you can. But if you were able to do that, that would be freaking awesome. <laughs> That's my two cents. And like I said, I believe this is additive to the bonus action crossbow expert attack rather than competitive, because you can use this for a little bit more damage, a little bit more versatility, but if somebody gets out of range of your spiritual weapon, like if they're running away from it with their 30-foot movement speed, then you can just crossbow expert them on the next turn instead of moving the spiritual weapon around. Or if you ever run out of spell slots, you can just keep up the bonus action attack with your spiritual weapon that way as well. So you can use both in a concerted way that your bonus action is always going to be spoken for to be doing some extra damage. Unless you have something else to do with your bonus action, which there will be some things in this build. Trust me, our bonus action is going to get very crowded. At level 4 of Cleric, we're going to get another ability score improvement. And once again, instead of taking the ability score improvement, I'm going to recommend taking a feat. And this time, I'm going to pick up Warcaster. With Warcaster, we have advantage on constitution saving throws we make to maintain concentration on a spell when we take damage. And since we did start as a fighter, we also have proficiency in constitution saving throws. So our concentration is going to be very hard to break now. Additionally, we can perform the somatic components of spells even when we have weapons or a shield in one or both hands. So that means we can now go in sword and board in melee if we wanted to equip a shield for some better AC. And when a hostile creature's movement provokes an opportunity attack from us, we can use our reaction to cast a spell at the creature rather than making an opportunity attack. This spell must have a casting time of one action and must target only that creature. But there are some good ones that we can target people with, uh, such as Command. That's a fun one. 
All in all, this is a fantastic feat, and I would take it even if the only thing we got was advantage on the con saves to maintain concentration, honestly. At level 5 of Cleric, we get Destroy Undead, but we also get third level spells! We get Spirit Guardians, we get Revivify, we get Dispel Magic, we get Aura of Vitality. We can now do the dreaded Spiritual Weapon plus Spirit Guardians combination for massive damage. Plus, we've got some fighter abilities that can actually sauce this up a little bit. If we Action Surge, cast Spirit Guardians right at the edge of the radius to draw as many people in as possible, and then focus on the one on like the very outside edge, we can... Then, with our Action Surge, use our Crossbow to make a couple of attacks and make Trip Attacks, maybe on multiple targets if the first one succeeds. Then, they are now prone within our Spirit Guardians, so they've got to spend half their movement to get up, which means they're probably not going to have enough movement left to reach us. Then we can just back off and then Crossbow Expert them again and, you know, knock them prone with Trip Attack and... After two rounds, we'll have used up all of our Battlemaster maneuvers, but between all of the crossbow damage, the maneuvers damage, and the Spirit Guardians damage, they're probably gonna be dead. And then if they're still not dead after that, then bring down the spiritual weapon on them and start bonking them on the head with that. An alternative, if they're already in melee range and you're quite surrounded when you cast Spirit Guardians, then you can go sword and board with, you know, whatever melee weapon you have handy, and do push attacks to knock them to the edge of Spirit Guardian's range. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that we can actually use our maneuvers to help Spirit Guardians out. It's a lot of fun. So at this point, we're at the halfway point of the build, and I wanted to take a break for a moment and talk about whether or not this multi-class as it stands, with five levels of fighter and five levels of cleric, is better than if we had just monoclassed 10 levels of fighter or 10 levels of cleric. I think the answer is that we are definitely better than a level 10 fighter, and arguably better than a level 10 cleric. Really, the only thing a level 10 fighter would have on us is an extra ability score improvement by this point. So, that's not really anything to write home about. I mean, they could have an extra feat. I mean, they could be rocking crossbow expert and sharpshooter, but I think our... Uh, cleric spellcasting more than makes up for that slight bump in power that the uh, feat would have granted us. For the cleric, I think the reverse is actually somehow also true, in that the additional martial ability that we get is better off than the additional utility we'd be getting from 4th and 5th level spells. I mean, we're competing with stuff like Greater Restoration, Raise Dead, so, you know, there's some good stuff in there, but I believe that instead of being a specialist and going for all of the cleric utility, our method of being a all-arounder that has some low-level cleric utility and then some extra martial talent added on top of that actually gives us a bit of an edge. At least if we count like all the pillars of play put together, I, I think we have a slight edge on a pure cleric. Not a very big one, and you can definitely argue the opposite depending on how you use some of those 4th and 5th level spells, but I think our 3rd level spells are plenty. We've got stuff like Aid, we've got stuff like Lesser Restoration if we want to take that. I mean, you know, it's there. We've got Pass Without Trace as a Trickery Domain Cleric. So, you know, we've got some utility spells. Uh, we've al always got Bless. You've always got Bless as a Cleric. I mean, that's almost a given that you take Bless. But yeah, that's, uh, that's how I see it at this point. Moving on to level 11 and our third multi-class, I'm going to pick up Wizard. Specifically, I'm going to be going with a War Magic Wizard, but we'll get to those features in a level once we get to them. For now, though, the big thing we get is Spellcasting. Once again, the best class feature that we could ever get. And with that feature, we get access to some impressive cantrips with Booming Blade and Minor Illusion. And with a build like this, where we have access to Disguise Self, 
I would actually recommend thinking about taking friends. We can pull off basically the same trick I went over with Charm Person, but this time with a cantrip. And bonus points if you disguise self as someone you really hate and get them in trouble. Oh, and since we are level 11 at this point, that is one of the thresholds for Booming Blade's power to increase. So right now, both of our damage rolls are increased to 2d8 on a hit and 3d8 when they move. And that 2d8 on a hit is in addition to the weapon's normal damage properties. So we can pump out some damage with Booming Blade at this level. And with our first level spells known, we are going to pick up Shield, Absorb Elements, and Silvery Barbs, and become the Reaction Spellcasting Master. We can pop Shield for plus 5 to our AC, which lasts until the start of our next turn, so that's good for a round. We can Absorb Elements to have the damage we take from an elemental attack, like a Dragon's Breath. Or we can Silvery Barbs to turn someone's attack roll hit into possibly a miss by forcing them to re-roll. Or by making a saving throw they succeed and have to re-roll and possibly fail. All great spells. At second level of Wizard, we choose our Arcane School and we get our War Magic features. We get Arcane Deflection, which allows us to use a reaction to either gain a plus two bonus to our AC against an attack or a plus four bonus to a saving throw. And this is whenever we're hit by an attack or fail a save. But when we use this feature, we can't cast spells other than cantrips until the end of our next turn. That is kind of a high price to pay, but since we are a Gish character, we've got melee stuff, we've got ranged stuff as a fighter, so we can still contribute even if all we have to cast are cantrips for a round. We also get Tactical Wit, which adds our Intelligence modifier to our initiative rolls. As for Arcane Deflection, I would really only use it against a particularly nasty saving throw that you're about to fail. Uh, we can do better than a plus two for our AC with the Shield spell, and then we don't have to suffer the consequence of not being able to cast another leveled spell until the end of our next turn. But we don't really have anything special against saving throws. So being able to add a plus four to one, that's pretty clutch in the right circumstance, and it's something we're definitely going to want to have. It's one of the main reasons I went for this instead of something like Bladesinger, with the other reason being that I actually want to wear heavy armor. I've got my eye on some Dwarven plate for this character. At level three of Wizard, we get access to second level spells. We can pick up stuff like Invisibility or Vortex Warp for some... Battlefield control, either offensively or defensively. You could get your friends out of a wall of fire, or put your enemies into a wall of fire. You know, have fun with that. Then at level 4 of Wizard, we pick up another ASI, and I'm going to use this to take Fey Touched, which is that half feat I was talking about earlier in the video. I'm using it to bump my Wisdom, and we're learning Misty Step, and one first level spell of our choice that's either from Enchantment or Divination, and I'm going to pick up Detect Magic, because one of the features of this spell is that we can cast them once for free, and having a free Detect Magic is pretty useful. It's always nice to know if that door you're about to go through is radiating Evocation Magic, because, yeah, it's probably going to blow up. Then at level 5 of Wizard, we get access to 3rd level spells. We can pick up stuff like Counterspell, Fly, Fireball... Enemies abound, animate dead, really there's a smorgasbord of great third level wizard spells to choose from, so just go through the list, grab the ones that you want, and never look back. <laughs> Until you find some more on like a scroll or in a spell book, then put them in your spell book and sometimes look back and be like, maybe I should prepare this today. Any hoozles, with that five levels of wizard behind us, it is time to move on to our final class, Rogue. And for our roguish archetype, we're going to be going after Arcane Trickster. The reason for that is simple. It's going to get us up to six level spell slots to upcast into with our first, second, and third level spells. Along the way, however, we are going to be getting our rogue features. At first level, we're going to get an extra proficiency, expertise in two skills, and sneak attack. Then at second level of Rogue, we're going to pick up Cunning Action, allowing us to dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action. 
at third level of rogue. This is when we're picking our roguish archetype, and we are picking up Arcane Trickster, as I said. We get some more spell casting and Mage Hand Ledger Domain, which allows us to have an invisible Mage Hand that we can do additional things with, like lockpick or make a sleight of hand check to pickpocket or any number of things. It's Mage Hand, but it's invisible. Go nuts. The spells that we're actually going to learn here as a third level rogue in the Arcane Trickster is really going to be kind of inconsequential, honestly, grand scheme of things. I'd pick up things that you haven't picked up from the wizard list yet and just always want to have prepared. Things like Find Familiar could be fine, but other than that, just kind of go nuts, maybe get some interesting utility and flavor spells. Encode Thoughts always seems kind of cool to me, but I never really have room to fit it on a build, but with all of our cantrips, why not Encode Thoughts? We could also get Illusory Script, and I mean, we could pair that Encode Thoughts with um, Detect Thoughts that we could pick up from the Wizard spell list. That's a second level spell that we could grab. So, you know, there's, there's things we can do here, and it's really going to be up to you at this point of the build. At level 4 of Rogue, we get our final ability score improvement, and once again, I'm going to be taking a feat, and I'm going to pick up the tough feat. At this level for us, that's 38 extra hit points, and it's going to be 40 very next level. This will get us over the 200 benchmark at a 20th level character. And last but not least, our capstone for this build is Uncanny Dodge. Whenever someone hits us with an attack, we can use our reaction to have that attack's damage against us. So... That's another way to use our reaction to mitigate incoming damage. So here we are with our character sheet at level 20. There is a lot going on here, but we'll try and cover it bit by bit and go over as much as we possibly can. So first and foremost, we do have 204 hit points. We are over that 200 benchmark. That is basically because of the tough feat that we just took and increasing our HP maximum by 40. We have 23 armor class, that is from our Dorvan Plate, our Ring of Protection, and our Shield. We could have higher or lower depending on the quality of magical gear that we found in our 20 level career, but I decided to go with something a little conservative in three rare magic items and one very rare magic item. I think that's plenty an estimate for what you would discover in a level 1 to 20 campaign. I'm sure any level 20 character that's been through an entire campaign would probably have much, much more than this. But I, I think this is a fair benchmark to just give some demonstration purposes for. Uh, we are not much of a skill monkey. Uh, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 skills, 2 with expertise. So we're really good at athletics and perception. We're okay at Stealth, Sleight of Hand, and Arcana, and everything else is, like, middling to low. Uh, our st saving throws, we've got Strength and Con. We've got Dex, Int, and Wisdom that are at least plus four. That's not bad. And we do have a War Magic feature that, if we fail a saving throw, we can add another four on top of that as a reaction. The caveat is that we can't cast spells other than cantrips for around after that, basically until the end of our next turn. But, you know, saving against a really important wisdom save or charisma save could be pretty important. Moving back over to our actions, we do have our trusty hand crossbow. I gave us a plus two. That's a rare magic item. I think that's completely appropriate to have. Uh, we would wind up with a 13 to hit to that with our archery fighting style, making this our more most accurate damage. Uh, we have a 1d6 plus 5 piercing off of that. That's because we only have a plus 3 to dex, so that plus 2 is getting us to our baseline of what we would be getting had we maxed out our dexterity. So I think this is rather fair for you know that, that purpose. Uh, I gave us a Flame Tongue Scimitar, because that sounded cool. That's something fun we can do in melee. You know, it does cost, cost a uh, bonus action to activate the first time, but then it's going to stay on until we uh, dismiss it or sheathe it, so that's fine there. And we can use that with uh, Booming Blade to really pour out some melee damage. And there are some things we can do with Booming Blade as well, 
that really put people in a disadvantageous position. We could booming blade with our action and then action surge and put up spirit guardians. So now they're in a lose lose. It's like, okay, well, do I move out of the spirit guardians or do I, you know, cause then I'll take booming blade damage or do I stay put and then the spirit guardians are going to get me and then they're going to booming blade me again next turn. It's a lose lose. And that's a, that's a fun catch 22 position to put people in. And that's just with a cantrip. Looking over the rest of our spells, we've got so many cantrips. I mean, look at all of our cantrips. What do we got? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 cantrips. That's not bad. That We are definitely a cantrip monkey. We've, we've got all the cantrips. We've got some good stuff. Yeah, I've gone over some stuff we can do with friends uh, in the main video. So that's, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's there for that. Don't need to go over that again. Again, at first level, we've got so many prepared spells. I mean, look at all of our first level spells we have prepared. Let, let's count these out. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 first level spells that we have to choose from. <laughs> Not bad at all. Makes it a shame we only have four spell slots, but we can upcast most of these. Most of these. Yeah, at second level, we start getting into stuff like aid, and that's another one that we're going to want to upcast as much as possible, because if we look down at the bottom here, we've made it all the way to six level spell slots. We've got one single one, but if we cast that for aid, that's another 25 HP, and that's going to up to three creatures within range. So that's not bad at all. And yeah, speaking of upcasting, down here we've got... A lot of great options for our six level upcast aid we we just mentioned uh spirit guardians becomes 68 spiritual weapon becomes 3d8 and yeah those are those are pretty good to upcast uh guardians we could upcast with a fifth but spiritual weapon doesn't get anything off of a fifth from a fourth it's still 2d8 from either of those but once we get to six it ups to a 3d8 so that is something to keep in mind for that as well and then, yeah, just look at this massive spell list of ours and all of our upcasting potential. <laughs> We've really got a lot going on. Yeah, Aura of Vitality down here at third level for some out-of-combat healing. <laughs> Great. You know, Counterspell to shut down enemy mages. We are going to have to roll for that. We are going to have to make a roll for that. And, you know, our modifier is only a plus three, so we're going to have to roll high to shut down some higher-level spells. But we can. It's there. We've got that potential. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't take the lucky feat. Otherwise, we could, you know, give ourselves another shot at that. But, you know, that is something to consider. If you want to take the lucky feat, that's always a good feat, no matter the build. And, yeah, moving on to our features. We've got so many. I mean, look at how long it's going to take us just to scroll down to the bottom of all of our features. We've got four classes worth of features plus feats. And a lot of these are going to be useful even up here at 20th level you know we've always got spell casting uh out of our three classes that can cast spells two that we're really going to be casting spells from one just gave us that six level spell slot but yeah i mean blessing of the trickster that's you can always just give somebody advantage on deck stealth checks doesn't require concentration, doesn't take a spell slot. That's just something we can always do. Uh, we could always use our channel divinity to get expended spell slots back up to level three. And then we can do basically the same thing uh, as a wizard with arcane recovery. If we can scroll down to that. Yeah, when we finish a short rest, we can get a combined level of three back. So we could potentially take a short rest use both of those features, and get two level three spell slots back. That's not bad at all. And then there's Arcane Deflection here. I mentioned that earlier. We really only want to use that for the plus four bonus to the saving throw. That is really the only thing to use it on, because the plus two to our AC is just outclassed by shield completely. The only thing that this gets is that we're not using a spell slot to cast it, but we can't cast a spell until the end of our next turn after this. So, you know... I would just cast shield, personally. 
Uh, yeah, but we've we've really got a lot going on. We got crossbow expert. We got our warcaster. Got tough. We got fey touched. And like I said, these these feats are highly interchangeable with other ones. The lucky feat I just mentioned. That's a great one to have. You could always add sharpshooter to crossbow expert to pump out a little more damage and not have to suffer the disadvantage to long range. And yeah, I mean, I think that's just about everything we really need to go over here on the sheet. This is basically just an exercise to show just how many features we have. And basically, we've got an answer for just about any situation that we find ourselves in. And that's that's pretty crazy. I mean, not many characters have the versatility that we have. And we are still pumping out the power, the utility, the support. I mean, there's just everything that you might want to be doing as a character. We can. <laughs> like, you know, we've got DPS. We've got healing. We've got stealth support. We've got, you know, other utility spells. You know, we can revivify to bring back a dead companion as long as we get to him in time. We can... Oh, man. Like, seriously. What What else? Let's, let, let's just name something else we can do. We can have the incoming elemental damage we get and then pump some back out with a melee attack. Or we could just go to our rogue features and... You know, have any incoming damage as long as we can see it with uh, uncanny dodge, you know, or we could cast shield and not take any damage at all, potentially, or, you know, if we get crit and we're pretty sure that their chance to hit is low enough that they might miss us, we could just uh, silvery barbs them from that and make them reroll that crit. We've got, like I said, we've got answers for just about everything. You know, we've got aid bumping up people's HP. We could turn invisible. We can turn invisible. We can teleport with Misty Step. We can teleport other people with Vortex Warp. <laughs> yeah, we could put on Mirror Image and basically become unhittable for, you know, like at least a full round of attacks. I mean, <laughs> you know, even if they get through our Mirror Image, yep, Shield, Silvery Barbs. And even if they get through all that, you know, Uncanny Dodge. Why not? <laughs> yeah, or a vitality. Mention that. Out of combat healing. Great. Counterspell. Great. Dispel magic. Great. We are going to, like I said, have to roll for both of these for higher level effects. And we're not the best at that. But we're not terrible. So, you know, it's still something we can do. Uh, we can fly. Yeah, of course. We can fly. Because why not fly? <laughs> And we can upcast that as well, so that we don't have to be using all of our uh, third-level spots for that. Yeah, there's just there's just so much to this character, and I, I really should stop the uh, the level twenty tour here, so that I just <laughs> don't start going over the same things over and over again. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's uh, that that's the character sheet at level twenty here, so. Let's go over some of the things that are like pros and cons. Not too many cons, but there are some. There are some that we, we really need to address. And then we'll, uh, we'll close out the video from there. So yeah, let's talk about this character just a little bit more before we close it out. Go over the viability, some of the pros and cons. Uh, in no particular order, I've just kind of got a list here of things that I've been noting down to myself throughout the build and in in the process of building it. So I've talked about the combo of booming blade with spiritual weapon. And I've talked about the combination of battle master maneuvers with, uh, uh, spirit guardians. And like all of that can kind of coalesce together all at once. If you get everything set up for that and action search really helps you with that. So, I mean, just that alone, honestly, is being able to play with, the battle master maneuvers, the spirit guardians, the spiritual weapon, the booming blade. I mean, there's just so much damage and control that you can put out just from that alone. And that's amazing. Just right there. Um, 
One of the cons I want to mention is that we have a lot of different reactions and it's going to be hard to choose which one to use. You know, we have shield, we have silvery barbs, we have absorb elements, we have uncanny dodge. So picking the right one for the right occasion is going to be a little tricky and making sure that we're using our reaction sparingly so that we have it for that big moment that we really need it. You know, not just jumping the gun on it every time we get attacked casting shield you know, then what if, you know, one of your teammates really needs to land a spell on somebody and they succeed the save and nobody else has silvery barbs and you could have cast that. So, you know, there's some some things to go over there in your head when you're playing. Uh, we do have a huge spell list in general. Like, we've got a lot of utility, we've got a lot of damage support, and we've got a lot of upcasting. And we've got great spells to upcast, like Aid, like Spirit Guardians, like Spiritual Weapon. So we really do have a lot more spell power than you'd think for a character that's... Uh, we're a little bit better than a half-caster, but we're not like a three-quarters caster. I think we're like a five-eighths caster. <laughs> I'm not sure that math is right. Somebody do that math and leave it in the comments, please. But <laughs> yeah, I'm sure not going to do it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but this character, we're really good at any distance as well. Like, in melee, we can pull out a melee weapon. You know, maybe that flame tongue scimitar that I uh, gave as a demonstration. That'd be really cool. And then at range, you know, we can pull out our hand crossbow or we can cast some spells. You know, we do have access to stuff like fireball if there's, like, a group of enemies with, like, ranged weapons at an extreme distance that are all a little bit... Uh, Minion-y, you can definitely fireball them and get some some good damage output that way. Get rid of some minions. Also, we have sneak attack. I mean, you know, sneak attack also happens to be in our wheelhouse. So on our uh, melee or ranged weapons, as long as we're using a finesse weapon or a ranged weapon, we can get the parameters for sneak attack to activate. I mean, at this... At, at a level 20 character, you should be able to find a way to either get advantage or get an ally near to get your sneak attack. It's 3d6 for us, so that's not, like, game-changing, but that's another 3d6 on your booming blade with your flame tongue scimitar <laughs> that you can then put out, you know, spirit guardians around and give them that catch-22. So, you know, more damage is more damage. It's never anything to scoff at. Um, we do have a little bit of lower bulk, especially if we didn't roll for stats and had to take a point by and dump con, then we wouldn't be over that 200 HP benchmark. Uh, so we really do need that tough feat to get that extra bit of HP to chunk us up just a little bit at the end. Uh, other than that, let's see, next thing on the list, uh, we actually have some pretty good mobility with this character. Between Misty Step, Fly, I mean, we've also got Vortex Warp to move other people around. So, you know, we can actually get around pretty darn well, even though we don't have any, like, specific features for that other than those spells. Our mobility is pretty good. Also, just in general, concentrating on spells is one of our strong suits. At level 20, we've got a plus 10 to Constitution saves, and advantage when we're trying to maintain concentration on spell after taking damage because of Warcaster. So it's really going to be hard to break our concentration. So our Spirit Guardians are staying up. You know, it's you're going to have to work very, very hard to break our concentration. Uh, another bit of a con, our bonus action is crowded. It There are a lot of things that are vying for our bonus action. We've got our crossbow expert attack. We've got spiritual weapon. We've got cunning action. You know, there's just a lot vying for our bonus actions attention. So we're going to have to be very tactical with that as well as our reaction. Um, our AC is actually pretty darn good with uh, some magical assistance. But we're able to use a shield when we're in melee combat. I haven't mentioned this yet, but you can't really use a shield with ranged combat because you need a hand free to reload your crossbow. So, you, you know, if we had an artificer on our team and they were really nice and gave us a repeating weapon on our crossbow, then we could have a crossbow and a shield. But other than that niche situation, it's our AC is going to drop by two 
when we're in ranged combat because we're not going to be have a sh- having a shield. But, you know, that's that that's just what it is. And yeah, I think that's uh that's about the list of things to go over. I hope I've touched on everything. And yeah, like I said at the beginning of the video, this character was designed backwards from level 20 to level 1 with all of these features in mind. And I really like it. Even level 1 to 20, like e- even the way that I presented it here, leveling up one at a time, taking one class at a time to five, and taking all four of them to level five, we get a lot of features. Level five is a power benchmark for most classes, so I guess it does make sense in hindsight that having four of those benchmarks all together is going to amount to something that might even be a little bit greater than the sum of its parts. At this point, we're having to compete with level 20 monoclass characters, so those clerics and wizards, the full spellcasters, are going to have some spellcasting utility on us. But I think, in terms of just general all-aroundness, utility, support, damage, healing, I mean, we've got a little bit of everything, and we're actually pretty darn good at everything. So, yeah, I mean, that's the character here it is. Have fun with it. And I guess I will sign off here and say, I'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Later.